this week on Forward. But as for like who's going to buy TikTok, you know, Steve Mnuchin's trying to get a group together. There's other folks out there that are talking about it. But the question is, what would you even be buying? You're right, Andrew, and in that like it's a super valuable product with a huge user base. I just think that it's going to be way more complicated than we're making it out to be. It is my pleasure to welcome to the podcast Senior Correspondent for Business and Technology at CBS News, beaming in from Los Angeles. I knew her before she was famous, Jolene Kent. Welcome, Jolene. Hey, Andrew. It's so good to see you again. I think we met back in 2014. And if I recall correctly, our mutual friend introduced us and you came on my podcast back when like no one was podcasting. <laughs> And you kindly shared your story of how you got to where you are. And it was it was great. It's great to be back together again. Yeah. What a decade it has been. Uh, congratulations <laughs> on all of your media success. Uh, you can see you. Jolene. Likewise. Yeah, you can see Jolene on CBS anytime you tune in. Uh, she's smart and well-networked and honest and resourceful. And I'm glad that major news networks uh, have kept trying to snatch you up. Uh, so would love to hear about your recent trip to Asia, where you talked to some of the leaders in AI, including someone that I know named Kaifu Lee, who people uh, don't know Kaifu. He wrote a book called AI Superpowers that uh, was all the rage a few years ago and talked about that there are these two massive competing AI universes between the US and China, and that China had a couple of structural advantages that they have more data, they don't have any privacy rules. <laughs> the, the Chinese government was, was going to help with the server farm and the compute infrastructure is what it's called. Fast forward a few years, is that what's happening in the world? So we see headlines about AI all the time here in the US. Um, uh, are there now the two parallel AI universes? And what did you find out while you were in Asia? It was a really fantastic trip. I hadn't been back to China or Hong Kong uh, in more than a decade. And so I was coming in cold. And um, my colleague at Fortune, she's the editor-in-chief, Allison Chantel, got up on the main stage and interviewed Kai-Fu Lee. He's the former president of Google Asia and has this incredible vantage point into what AI is. And basically, you're right. Like there's two, he continues to confirm that there are two parallel tracks. In fact, when he was speaking to all of us, he said, look, the U.S. and Asia are actually, or U.S. and China are likely to never compete going forward if the current geopolitical system stays the way it is, because it's basically two parallel universes. It's the U.S. pursuing its type of AI with its protections against China and vice versa. Um, and he said that you're unlikely to see kind of um, collaboration or cr cross-pollination unless it's in a country that is friendly to both nations, which he says is increasingly rare. And obviously with the rhetoric coming out of DC, it's like, that's not wrong. Yeah, so what, what I naturally think, what most other people think is uh, the EU would gravitate toward this US Western type system. And then there would be a competition for Africa. Um, and then that leaves the rest of Asia and South America uh, so what is the Chinese AI orbit? Like, what are the countries that are saying, you know what, I'm going to take a pass on the mega tech companies of the West, and I'm going to align with China's data universe. So China's investing billions in Africa, um, and I yeah. believe Asia. And so I feel like part of that is going to be to, uh, to induce people to play ball with their data ambitions. Yeah, I mean, this kind of diplomacy, if you will, like tech diplomacy, dates back to pre-Cold War days, right? And this is all about China's use of soft power, which they have been basically plotting and deploying in countries throughout Africa, parts of Latin America. And so as a result of their presence there, whether it's economic or infrastructure, deploying technology and having adoption, especially at the early stages of AI adoption in countries throughout Africa is they've got an advantage against the U.S., like without a doubt. And you also have, you know, 
the U.S. and Europe, especially Europe, have these more developed, advanced regulations and standards that in China, as Kaifu Lee was talking about in Hong Kong last week, you know, they have their own type of agenda and it's different. And so the the competition that you see between the U.S. and China is it's kind of a zero sum game in AI right now, it seems like um, with China having the data advantage but the U.S. having the innovation advantage and the ability to create products faster, better. I mean, Kai-Fu Lee said that, you know, if you compare the actual stuff of AI, the skills, U.S. versus Chinese companies, the U.S. still has a advantage, but the Chinese are creeping up super fast and they're probably going to be able to catch up within a handful of years. Yeah, there was a joke in AI. I don't think it was from Kai Fu. It said, how far behind is China from the U.S.? And the joke was 12 hours because they would wake up and just see whatever we did. <laughs> I don't even give a day. like that. Yeah. I mean, I think there's some really fantastic innovation happening in AI in China. And you also see that when it comes to medical technology and AI uses of medical technology or the way that AI is being deployed in medicine. And I interviewed uh, in Hong Kong the CEO of Medtronic, and he's this is a Minnesota company with a global reach, right? They do robotics. They're now developing AI to detect colon cancer um, by looking at colonoscopies. And this kind of technology is brought into China and deployed at the local level because it hasn't really been developed yet. But the Medtronic CEO told me his goal is to localize and to either acquire companies or invest in companies so that they can build this kind of technology specific to the Chinese um, to Chinese users who need this and to Chinese customers. And so even though the U.S. technology is technically more advanced, U.S. companies are now looking into China now that things are sort of post-COVID and thinking, okay, how do we build revenue streams here that satisfy both the geopolitical situation but also the revenue opportunity? Well, just the fact that the CEO of Medtronic was there making that case is a lot. I mean, they're a very, very big American company. Um, yeah. And the fact that they're still investing um, in the Chinese market in that way is is actually very meaningful. Uh, mm -hmm. So the major news story that people are seeing about U.S., China, and tech is TikTok. Uh, so, I know. So the House came together and actually passed essentially a divestment bill um, that is sitting in the Senate. And someone at dinner asked me the other night, they said, hey, do you think this bill is actually going to come to pass? And I said, I think it will, uh, because that, you know, I mean, it passed the House resoundingly. And yeah. there are a number of Bipartisan. senators. Yeah, the number of senators have already come out for it in various ways. I'm sure you get asked this all the time. Um, there are various folks who've even publicly raised their hands and said, hey, I'd like to buy TikTok. Um, you know, since, yeah. you, since you would need to find a U.S. Steve buyer. Mnuchin, the former Treasury Secretary. Yeah, and I'm sure there are others. Uh, now, you would need access to uh, tens of billions of dollars, I think, to buy TikTok, um, mm -hmm. but it could be worth that easily. If you talk to any young person in the United States, uh, the odds of TikTok being their number one uh, app in terms of news and time spent is very, very high. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah it's like exactly. So what, what are you seeing and hearing? Do you think that this bill is likely to, to pass and then who might want to snap up TikTok? Look, I think President Biden has already said if it comes to his desk, he's going to sign it. The real question now is what is the majority leader in the Senate, Chuck Schumer, going to do? So he's under all this pressure right now to hold a vote, to schedule a vote on the bill. And you're right, it passed with that overwhelming like bipartisan majority, what was it, last month? Um, the question, though, is the Senate tends to take things slower. They look at things in a little bit more, perhaps, granular detail than members of the House, uh, by and large. And I think it's the lack of progress so far in the weeks since the House passed it and the Senate has been holding on to it. It's probably been pretty frustrating for some people. But what we're seeing in this time is TikTok going full on PR campaign to try to save the app and keep it in the U.S. I mean, you can watch any sort of like digital ad or broadcast ad right now, and they are basically like rallying against this ban, and they're doing it, interestingly, in like battleground states. And so as they're doing this, the question is like how much pressure and like how much does that actually work? 
But as for like who's going to buy TikTok, you know, Steve Mnuchin's trying to get a group together. Um, there's other folks out there that are talking about it. But the question is, what would you even be buying if this gets signed, right? So like say President Biden signs it, it goes into law. Is it even possible to buy the algorithm from ByteDance? And if it is, is it as valuable as it once was? And and these are all questions that like Sho Chu, the CEO of TikTok, like isn't answering because he's hoping to save the company, right? But it's a real technical situation. It's not just like, oh, I'm going to buy like the plant behind you and bring it over here to my soil. It's like, what is the stuff you would actually get? And would it even be that valuable? Because if it's so proprietary, if the TikTok algorithm is so proprietary and excellent, and that's not even being sold, then like, is there even going to be like a buyer who legitimately wants this product? Like, I don't know. Hey YouTube, thanks for watching. Please do hit like and subscribe and hit that bell if you want to be notified every time a new episode drops, probably on Mondays, but hit that bell and thank you. Well, I, I think there would be, Joe Ling, in part because uh, you have so many creators on it and the, and the audience is there. And so let's say that ByteDance says, okay, we're going to divest it, but we're going to take our algorithm with us, which is quite likely because uh, there is, yeah. as you say, immense value of the algorithm. And they're like, this is not what we're going to sell. So if you buy yeah. this thing, you get the accounts, <laughs> you get the uh, users, the, the users uh, and uh, and then you're going to have to replace the algorithm. Good luck with that. And then the value might go down um, to some number that's lower than it is right now. And, the, you know, the commercial value of TikTok. It's interesting. I mean, there, there, there are some numbers that are publicly available. Certainly usage rates are sky high. The revenue, yeah. I, like it, it strikes me that um, there are probably opportunities to monetize TikTok further that would make it more annoying for people. But, you know, you got to pay the bills and whatnot. Um, I, I think that the value would be less than uh, with the algorithm, but I think someone's going to want to buy that thing um, with, uh, you know, the, the thoughts like, look, um, you know, like our algorithm might not be as fancy and addictive uh, as the current, um, but then you're going to get the clean bill of health in terms of because um, there are st still people who have reservations about um, using TikTok because of the um, Chinese government connection. Uh, and then you maybe you think you get a better deal. Um, so I, I think you'd have no shortage of people queuing up for this thing. Um I mean, the other people who are like trying to buy it, right, are you have the Shark Tank guy, Kevin O'Leary, because um, he says he's going to buy it. And then you have Bobby Kotick saying, you know, he was the former head of Activision Blizzard, like is trying to come up with a group to buy it. You're right, Andrew, and that like it's a super valuable product with a huge user base. I just think that it's going to be way more complicated than we're making it out to be. Like, even with a TikTok man, like, it takes a long time. If TikTok is really, like, forced to, like, divest and leave, like, it's going to take a long time for people to stop using the existing app because it has to, like, basically degrade in the app store, right? Then you have all of these questions we've already been talking about. So I just feel like it's going to be, like, the weirdest least clear <laughs> thing ever and like probably really frustrating to users, which kind of or could potentially prove the point of what TikTok is trying to argue on, on their side, which is like, if you get rid of us, then more people are going to migrate to like Instagram, Meta, you know, like all the other platforms. You're going to give more power to fewer platforms. Like I can see the logic in that a little bit, um, but I also can see the national security implications and the threat and the data collection, like that's obviously clear too. So talking about uh, weird social media companies, uh, Truth Social. <laughs> oh my God. I am, I am not ready on Truth Social, to be honest. Well, so uh, let, let's talk about it from an outsider's perspective, because I will admit to not being on Truth Social as well. But here are the things that we publicly know. Um, it's uh, losing money, um, quite a lot of money. And it's valued at uh, billions of dollars in a way that has no relationship with the 
numbers, um, mm. the revenue or the path to profitability. And, and it really does seem like it's a meme stock taken to the extreme that there are a lot of followers of Trump who say, hey, screw the man, screw the establishment, screw the math, <laughs> screw the numbers. <laughs> like, let's let's uh, bid this stock up as a show of allegiance to Trump and uh, a way to stick it uh, to folks who are doubters. It's really pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, you would think that eventually the two things would end up converging. Um, and uh, one of the major questions is, can Trump get to a point where you can actually cash in because I, I want to say there's like a lockup period of let's call it six months. Um, so if the valuation is still sky high X months from now, he might be able to sell stock at this crazy valuation and, and uh, rake in hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe even more. Um, so it's a little bit of a race against time. Yeah. I mean, look, let's like contextualize this a little bit in terms of just the numbers, right? So if you look at last year, Trump media made $4.1 million, according to reports. Then you look at Twitter, now known as X, and that's also a relatively, compared to the others, like a smaller platform, so smaller social platform. And X brought in 100 times that. So like when you're... And that was during, like, that was, like, a, a ahead of its, like, IPO in, like, 10 years ago. And so it's just the, the size of it makes me wonder. And I don't know enough about it to, like, know how much you can actually like, capitalize on it. But I wonder, I think the critics out there are saying, like, Truth Social is just, like, another one of the inflated values of, of Trump's physical properties um, just on the Internet. Hey, all, if you know me, you know I'm not that handy in the kitchen, and I have become a huge believer and booster of Factor. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals make eating a joy. It's so fast, you just pop that thing two minutes later, and you are eating a restaurant-quality, healthy meal, making you feel excellent about yourself. My favorite is the turkey chili with zucchini, and there is so much more to choose from. You never get tired of it. It fits any budget. It's fast, healthy. It is going to be the new factor in your life. Yes, I'm a fan. Head to factormeals.com slash yang50 and use code yang50 to get 50% off your first box and two free wellness shots per box while subscription is active. That's code yang50 at factormeals.com slash yang50 to get 50% off your first box. Get Factor today. It's going to change the way you eat. So one of the major news stories of this last month was this mega settlement between the National Association of Realtors uh, and a bunch of folks who said, hey, why are we all paying a 6% commission on houses? Mm -hmm. Uh, so the actual settlement was something like $418 million. Uh, it hasn't been approved as yet. It looks like it will be. It hasn't officially gone into effect. Um, what was the read from the business world on this settlement? Do people think it's going to help the U.S. real estate market? I was talking to realtors all about this as I was reporting out the story. And basically, it was a settlement thanks to an antitrust uh, antitrust settlement. And so there, the National Association of Realtors is paying that $418 million. But more importantly, for buyers and sellers, they've agreed to drop their commission rules for buying and selling homes at like standard, what, 5 to 6% yeah. um, that you see. And so the realtors I spoke with are like, this is probably not going to have like a major impact on home prices, but it'll certainly help people um, when it comes to selling your home. But basically it's like the critics say that like the National Association of Realtors had this like lock, this like monopoly essentially. And they were sort of untouchable in the words of one expert that I talked to. And then people were starting to question like, okay, what exactly, what services are real estate agents actually providing, especially in a time where we have so much information, whether you're checking on Zillow or Redfin or whatnot, and you're kind of doing this search yourself. And so the idea is like, 
it exacerbated the affordability crisis. And so maybe now that it will be rolled back, it's supposed, if it's approved by the courts, it's supposed to be rolled back in July, then maybe it will help in, in, in some cases. Um, because everyone's asking the same questions, like why are housing prices so high? Like, and you know, there's a lot of forces around that. Obviously inventory is an issue, but these associated costs in the eyes of the critics out there are like driving up the price. So the NAR was basically like, okay, we're not going to like fight this anymore. We're just going to settle it and like try and get it to bed. And like, they think that this is going to be best for their own outcome, but it remains to be seen. I think it depends on what kind of real real estate agency or realtor you're talking to. Yeah. So some of the numbers, the average U.S. home price is now around four hundred seventeen thousand. Uh, so a six percent commission added about twenty five thousand dollars to the cost of buying a home, and you'd have to think that that's going to go down. I certainly am part of the gajillions of Americans who Zillow snoop and you know just look yeah. around. Yeah. Um, and, and it does seem like this commission is something of an anachronism <laughs> like an earlier time, because at this point, yeah, you find out a lot. Of, yeah. yeah, yeah. You can find out a lot about homes as a buyer or a seller. It was unclear why you were paying this 6%. Um, one of the things that, that did give me pause on it is that there are about one and a half million realtors in the U S two thirds of them are women um, because it's kind of a part-time role that you can fit in, in various ways. The median it's income yeah. in 21 was something like $42,000, which translates to someone selling like a house or two a year in, in most communities. Um, and, and so what you're doing in, in many ways, I think it is going to lower prices at the margins, um, but at, at the expense of this part-time job that uh, hundreds of thousands of women were doing um, around the country. Uh, and yeah, yeah. And so, that, so there's part of me that's like, look, I'm I'm pro this move because if you can reduce friction from a market as important as the real estate market, you want to do it. And like, you know, paying an extra six percent really doesn't make any sense. But but I, I I will say that it's interesting too. Like, you bring up a really interesting point because you're talking about like a workforce, right? A major yeah. workforce. Yes. yes and so. Yes. In, when the real estate agent I talked to here in Southern California, like just south of LA, he was telling me this guy named Rick Elder, and he is from he owns Vista Sotheby's. They sold 1,200 homes in, in Southern California last year. He's got 250 agents, right? Obviously, not all of those are full time agents, like you said. And so his take was he doesn't think there's going to be like a change in the revenue that his real estate agency brings in. But he thinks that newer agents who are trying to break in and come into the market are going to have to work harder to make the same amount of money that they maybe once would have pre-settlement. And his idea is like, that's actually good for the consumer because you have to have more customer service and more sophistication in the way you approach your clients to actually provide what he calls more value to the people who are hunting for homes. Yeah, I think he's right. It's It's going to advantage the uh, more professional firms that uh, have the ability to deliver value. Um, and then the, frankly, like the, the random person looking for a second job, it's going to be much, much harder for them to have any kind of foothold and then justify uh, a commission at a certain level. I mean, you referred to it earlier. I mean, the main reasons why houses are so expensive in the U.S. has to do with the fact that we haven't built enough and you have these zoning regs that uh, restrict various affordable uh, housing units. I'm actually on the advisory board of a company called Pad Split that mm. tries to make it so that uh, different service workers can rent rooms in various houses. And one of the main things they run afoul of is like local regs. I'd like, no, 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 you can't do that. Even though, by the way, the vast majority of people who are using pad split as consumers are people of color who work in service occupations and don't want to have to commute two hours to get to their job. You know I mean? It, it's, it's super. So you have um, rules and regs that are keeping um, housing supply down. And then of course you have these high interest rates, which we can dig into a little bit more that have oh, doubled man. the effective mortgage of most <laughs> Brutal. Um, ho homes. And so you show up and be like, I can't afford this. Cause you know, you do the math on an 8% mortgage, like you, you'd be paying yeah. uh, twice as much per month as you would have uh, a little while ago. So those are the main things that, that are keeping the housing market um, out of reach. Uh, though I do think this settlement might shave a couple percentage points off of what people are paying. 
Yeah, I mean, look, you have so many people locked out of the housing market. Like, just not just interest rates, but like all the things you just talked about, right? So you have them, a lot of pent up demand over the past few years. People just like waiting at the gates to tap into what does create generational wealth and major like economic security, like all the things you want as part of the American dream. People can't get it. And so this settlement could benefit buyers in that way in that it will maybe you know, shave prices a little bit and allow more people in. But overall, because of that high demand, don't expect your prices to like come down in a super meaningful way because that takes time, not just because of the Federal Reserve and Jerome Powell, but overall when prices come up this far, you know, they don't drop like a rock. It, it takes a while. Yeah. Sellers hate to have prices go down as part of it. Uh, that they're of course, like there are yeah. a lot of folks who just take their place off the market and be like, I'll wait for it to bounce back because uh, like they they uh, like, you know it's funny. There's like well, like people will uh, recalibrate to a new value if it goes up, but they won't recalibrate if it goes down. <laughs> That'll be like my true value. Reality is here. too brutal. It's too hard. This podcast is sponsored by Helix Sleep. I have always been a mattress guy. I thought if you're gonna spend eight hours doing something, you should pay attention to what you're doing it on. That's why I love the Helix Sleep product. It is made for me. I am someone who sleeps on my back. I do not sleep hot. I like a firm mattress. And so when I took the Helix Sleep quiz, I wound up with a Helix Dawn model. And it's been fantastic, not just for me, but for my kids who seek it out out of the entire house. Don't want to take my word for it. Helix has been awarded the number one mattress pick by GQ and Wired Magazine, and they have a 100 night free trial and 10 to 15 year warranty is baked in. That's confidence in your product. And if you get on a Helix Sleep mattress, you will see why they are so confident. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash yang and use code helixpartner20. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. The current inflation measurement, I was talking uh, to uh, Zach Grauman about this uh, on the podcast uh, recently. The current inflation measurement doesn't include housing. Um, it used to back in the 70s, and then now they don't include housing as part of the, the um, CPI bucket. Uh, and apparently, if you included it housing, uh, it would be a lot higher uh, and because people's rents keep going up and the cost of housing keeps going up. And so there's an argument as to why there's so much discontent with the economy when the measurements look kind of positive. Uh, it's because housing isn't really included in in uh, what people think of as inflation. If you did, then there'd be a, a clear reason why people are ticked off, <laughs> honestly, I'd, I'd like that cost of living. But look, like I have all this data like cover, so I cover inflation, right? And so if you look at not just like CPI, consumer prices, you're also looking at producer prices and like rent and food, I believe, like drive so much of why those prices remain hot and above the elevated, above the levels that the Fed wants to see. And so that overall cost and that pent up demand and like the low inventory, like all of it, drives this like difficult economic situation that we're in where you can ask the Biden administration and they'll be like, yeah, like data is good. Like things are looking better. And most of the people I interview who are not like, you know, representing the Biden administration or they don't feel great about they the economy. No, I mean, not. I talked to a bunch of Democrats in Michigan a few weeks ago, for example, right? Secretary Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary, is coming to visit, campaigning on behalf of the president, really worried about Michigan. Yep. All of those Democrats I talked to, all four of them are like, I can't buy the home I want to buy. My grocery bills are insane. And these are people who are going to vote for the incumbent president. And yet they're like, I can see why people are not going to do it. The reason they continue to support Biden amid this inflation situation is because they don't want the alternative. And so their argument is like a democracy, like save democracy argument. Yep. But when you're talking to a real true swing voter, 
who feels like they are not doing better and they are constantly hemorrhaging cash and they're working 45, 50 hours a week, that inflation argument is the number one thing that's going to drive the way they're going to vote. It's just the reality of the situation. And it doesn't matter what is calculated into inflation, what you feel is how you will vote. And so the Biden administration has told me, like I've talked to, I've interviewed the um, lead economic advisor to President Biden, um, the National Economic Council director, Lael Brainerd. And she's yep. like, there's a lag. It's going to feel better soon. We're working hard on behalf of American families. It's going to happen. The White House comms team is also pushing that message. But there has been very little materialization outside of like consumer confidence that people are feeling that directly. So it's a pretty tough argument to make. Yeah, and time is running out, honestly, because there is a lag between some kind of condition changing and people adopting a, a different attitude or a better attitude. It reminds me of a focus group that was run on independent voters in Wisconsin. Uh, and and uh, a, a guy, I think he was a welder, who voted for Trump and then Biden, so he's like the definition of your swing voter, um, yeah. said that he's going to vote for Trump. Uh, and his he said, I'm going to turn off my TV for four years and just enjoy the economy. So in, in other oh. words, the, 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 the thought was, look, you could tell me about what a jerk Trump is and, you know, the pro-democracy argument. I'm just going to turn off the TV and ignore it and, and just uh, have, uh, in his mind at least, better economic conditions. And look, that's tapping into something really interesting. That is tapping into memory and sentiment about how Republicans traditionally are perceived to handle the economy versus Democrats. And you can see it in the polling data all across the country. People believe and remember Trump's economy more fondly yep. despite the pandemic and all of the challenges there than they do about the current economy, even though the numbers by definition are stronger. And so it doesn't really matter in the end for most people what the data say. It matters what you feel. And if that is your perception of the economy and inflation continues to persist at this like really annoying, high sticky level, that's a very understandable feeling. Trump is up on the economy among independents by 25 points uh, versus Biden. And, and that's really the sticking point to your, uh, to your argument, where if independents just remember uh, 2016 to 2020, much more positively, uh, which many of them do, uh, then Trump wins on that issue. And that's going to be the main issue for uh, a lot of voters. Uh, so we're talking about interest rates in part in the economy. Um, it, it seems like uh, everything hinges on uh, Jerome Powell and the Fed and, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> interest rates. Uh, I mean, Jerome Powell would definitely not agree with that, but I would say that from a consumer perspective, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're look. They're supposed to cut rates. The Fed is supposed to cut rates come June. Where are we with inflation right now? We're not easing down to the two percent target in a meaningful way, which is what Chair Powell wants to see. So, what happens? It's like you've got this May meeting, you've got this June meeting. If there's not a cut, how close are we? Are they willing to go to the election to maintain their political independence? and still cut rates? That's a really tough question. And a, a lot of economists say it's going to be like just summer or maybe September. But like literally everyone I know is talking about this. Like people who don't even know really what the Fed does is like, when is Jerome Powell going to cut rates? Like it's just such a pervasive question because it affects everything. Mortgages, car loans, credit card rates, everything. Stock market. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that one in there. Yes. I wonder, though, how much like the, the first cut is already priced in to the market. Well, well, that's the point in, in, uh, like I get from um, investors I know where they say, look, there's a traditional relationship between interest rates and bond prices and the stock market. And so ordinarily, if you jack up interest rates the way that you have, uh, then um, bonds will become more valuable. and The stock market will come down. The stock market has not come down, obviously. And so the no. person looks at this and says, okay, the traditional relationships aren't quite um, working out. Uh, and they also think that the interest rate cuts are priced into the stock market. So if, if he, if they say, look, inflation's running too hot, so we're not going to cut rates, you'd probably um, see a correction develop in the stock market. There are a lot of folks I know who do think that the Fed 
is trying to make sure that things are good you know, in heading into November, honestly, <laughs> where, where they're, they're trying to. Oh, yeah, a lot of people use, believe that yeah. it is not independent. That is 100% correct. A lot, a lot of people believe that. Um, the Fed believes otherwise and says otherwise. They they say they are in, they have to be independent of the White House, um, which is, you know, the standard rule, obviously. Um, I guess what I wonder is. There's so much anticipation of this first rate cut. It goes back to what you were saying or what we were talking about earlier. It's like, is it already like priced in the market? How much of a difference will it actually make? Um, a quarter point cut is a significant amount, but after so much raising and sustaining, I don't know, I'm just curious to see how this plays out. I wish I had a magic eight ball to be like, okay, what is going to happen here? This podcast is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Going online without ExpressVPN is like changing while leaving your window wide open. You might not have anything to hide, but why give randos a chance to invade your privacy? When you go online without a VPN, ISPs can see every single website you visit and they can legally sell this information without your consent to ad companies and big tech who can then use your data to target you and profit, not to your benefit, generally at your expense. So using ExpressVPN, it's like being a member of a high tech company that's on your side where they beam you into a server in another part of the world, no one can see anything you do. Just fire up the app, click one button and you're beamed onto a completely safe, anonymized internet. They can't do anything with your data. I use ExpressVPN to have that peace of mind. To secure your online activity by visiting expressvpn.com slash yang today. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S VPN.com slash yang. And you can get an extra three months for free. Expressvpn.com slash yang. Well, it, it's playing out in interesting ways. I mean, I, I'm in touch with a lot of entrepreneurs and startups, and a lot of them have had a really hard time raising money. Uh, oh, and this, yes. And and this is something that the interest rates plays a direct role in, where, look, it, you know, they call it ZERP, like the zero interest rate um, in, environment. It's like, look, if I'm getting zero in my cash, and then some startup comes and says, we're going to grow, grow, grow. It's like, sure. Like, you know, what am I going to do with this money? Otherwise, <laughs> but, but, right. but, it's but like now- a, it's, good place to gamble. Yeah, but now if you're getting, you know, five and a half percent on cash and then like more on, uh, you know, like other fixed income instruments, essentially risk free. And then the startup comes along um, and says, hey, invest, invest. I mean, I know a bunch of entrepreneurs who've had to take uh, what's called down rounds, which is their evaluation mm -hmm. of their company shrunk. I know other outfits that are shutting down where they just haven't been able to raise the money. Um, I was in Silicon Valley very recently, and they're dealing with like a lot of triage. And then if you are a startup, uh, a lot of it's around whether you can operate profitably, whether you can get to break even. If you can't, uh, investors don't have as much of an appetite to fund grow, grow, grow um, without a real path to profitability. It's one reason why True Social is so weird <laughs> is because very much an exception. Um, but, uh, you know, the other major exception really has been a lot of the public markets where you've seen a revaluation in the private market among startups where people are looking at you saying like, you know, like uh, where, where, where's the cash, where's the profitability. And then uh, for public companies, you've seen still really elevated price to earnings ratios. Uh, and there are some people I know who are looking at this environment saying, yeah, like th th there's something up where, um, it, it seems like there are some traditional financial relationships that don't seem to be holding true. And, uh, and uh, again, uh, it all does come back to um, the Fed. But think about it. Think about it. Like like when when my husband and I purchased our home, rates were sub 3%. And now the Fed, fund rate, Fed funds rate is over 5%. And that, you just do the math on how much something costs just a couple of years ago versus now if you're talking about buying a home, especially first-time homeowners. That is a huge economic barrier now in a way that didn't exist before. So talk about like how people feel about the economy, sort of that like vibe session situation that we're like still in. 
it's not just inflation on your monthly expenses like gas, groceries, car insurance, stuff like that. It's the psychological block of like not being able to achieve and unlock the next stage of the video game that is life. That is so difficult to do right now. And that is really where people are feeling like, gosh, like I don't, I'm getting screwed. I have worked so hard. I have put in my time to get to this point. I can't, I feel stuck. And that's a really frustrating position to be in. Yeah, that, that's a lot of what I saw when I traveled the country um, over the last number of years. I mean, there are people that have been working very, very hard and they feel like they're stuck in mud. Uh, they don't feel great about their kids' prospects. Uh, I mean, to me, the definition of the American dream is that you think your kids are going to do better than uh, you did. And statistically now that's uh, becoming more and more dubious, uh, you know, and, and um, it, it's one reason why I, I think this is going to be a tough election for the incumbent, um, because if you make the case like, hey, we're, we're doing well and give us more time, like more and more Americans um, don't feel that. The vibe session is a, a fine way to put it. This is going to be a wild year. Um, you know, people yeah. people feel... Some people have said to me, it's like, look, there is no way that the Biden administration is going to let the wheels fall off this economy, <laughs> kind of going into this election. Um, and I do think that. And I think, yeah, that makes sense. And I, I hear that they're pulling levers right and left to try and um, make things good, honestly, uh, uh, through 2024. It is even if like from a reporter, like a journalist standpoint, it's like even if everything is being done to improve and judge the economy. When I'm out there talking to people in Michigan, in Nevada, here in California, across the country on the East Coast, like you can't control how people feel. Yeah. And and be, inflation has this link and historically inflation has been like this. Inflation has a lingering effect on people and it stays because just because inflation, the rate comes down and it's a braggable data point for lawmakers doesn't mean in prices have gone down. True. And just the rate of change has gone down, but like the price down. Down, down, down. It's like, yeah, oh, we're like, say, say we hit like a really great number when inflation comes out next. Okay, but that just means prices are going up more slowly than they were a month ago or a year ago. And that's just like prices, but the other unfortunate truth of how most economies work is prices don't go back to the way they used to be. And so you have to kind of like a like if messaging around that and campaigning on that is really tough. Yes. Yeah, someone talked to me about the price of a carton of eggs uh, the other day where, you know, they're like, I'm paying 10 bucks for a carton of eggs and it makes me want to like, you know, jump out a window. And it's like, if you say to them, hey, don't worry, now your carton of eggs is still going to cost $10 next month. <laughs> like that, 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 that. Or also, like, if you're paying $10 for a carton of eggs, like, is it being, like, personally hand-delivered by, like, like, like a golden goose in its cage free and organic? Because you can go to Trader Joe's and get cheaper eggs. But you know what I mean? Like, It was a big carton. I think he said it was 30 eggs. It's one of, like, the Oh, it was 30 cards. eggs. Oh, oh, $10 for 30 eggs is actually pretty good. Wait a second. Uh, Joling, uh, you're brilliant and incisive. Uh, how can people keep up with you and your reporting, aside from turning on CBS News? Um, and you're like around the clock, sort of. Like, is, is it morning news? Is it evening news? Uh, is it yeah. uh, at, at any moment? It's all of it. I think the best way to keep up is to watch CBS Mornings and CBS Evening News and across our streaming platforms. But also follow me on uh, the... <laughs> the craziness that is X. I'm on Instagram. Just search my name. You'll find me. And uh, hopefully I can add value to the conversation. The great Jolene Kent. Uh, I definitely urge you to follow her. I do. Uh, she just gets out there and reports, which is exactly what you want from journalists today. And I got to say, CBS News is pretty freaking like non-ideological up the middle um, in my uh appearances and conversations like i've always been well treated by cbs and it makes me think well, i'm glad of, to hear that yeah no it's true and it makes me think like the, right. the people watching cbs um are, are actually expecting something objective and that's what they get well we love our viewers and andrew it is such a pleasure to be back together with you even virtually thank you for having me yes thank you Lang. we'll do it again soon high five okay. congratulations on everything too i'm really happy for you 
Thank you. You're so kind. It was great to be on with you today.